In a series of audio recordings and writings that would be discovered after the rampage, Marvin Hemeyer would give us a glimpse into the reasoning and his thought processes behind building a virtually unstoppable bulldozer that he would take on a rampage through the town of Granby, Colorado. His quote, I was always willing to be reasonable until I had to be unreasonable. And sometimes reasonable men must do unreasonable things. So what the hell happened to make Marvin Hemeyer so mad that he spent a year and a half designing and building a killdozer that he would use to destroy a town? Well, you're about to find out. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching Lawyer Up. In today's episode, we are looking at the life of Marvin Hemeyer. We're going to examine what led him to be so outraged at his community that he would purchase a bulldozer, modify it to basically become a tank, and then proceed to town, destroying not everything in his path, but very specific targets involving individuals who he perceived had wronged him. We're going to hear excerpts from the nearly two hour and 45 minutes of tapes, audio recordings, that he made leading up to the incident, basically explaining his dispute, his reasonings for what he was doing, and that he felt that God had commissioned him for this destructive purpose. We're going to look at the futile efforts of law enforcement to stop the killdozer. And finally, we're going to look at what brought the rampage to an end. If you enjoy the video, if you learned something, hit that like button for me. If you got something to say, put it in the comment sections below. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, what are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button for me. And you guys know it. I love it when you share my videos on social media. And by now, you guys know that Lawyer Up has partnered with Webull, the online broker that allows you to buy and sell stocks or crypto or whatever you are into directly from your phone. Webull is free to join. It's free to use. There is no cost to buy or sell. So it's commission-free trading. Better yet, when you sign up and you link your bank account and deposit as little as one penny, Webull will give you at least two free stocks worth at least $3 per share. So it's free money. So if you would like to join the over 2 million Webull traders, all you have to do is click on the link in the description below. Happy trading. Marvin John Hemeyer was a welder by trade and who lived in Granby, Colorado. Granby is a town of about 2,000 people, and it is located in the center of Colorado, not too far from the Colorado River. In 1992, Marvin purchased two undeveloped acres of land in Granby for $42,000, upon which he would build a muffler shop that he would own and work at. After purchasing the property, Marvin was approached by Mountain Park Concrete, owned by a Cody DeChef, who offered to purchase the property to build a concrete plant. After initially reaching an oral agreement to sell the property for $250,000, Hemeyer backed out of the deal, upping the purchase price to $375. Now, rumors were that Mountain Park Concrete didn't like that, but they might have paid for it. But before they could ink the deal, Hemeyer increased his demand to $1 million. Well, needless to say, Mountain Park kindly said no thank you, and they moved on. And after some time, they ultimately ended up purchasing a piece of land right next to the muffler shop, and for a hell of a lot less than a million dollars. And although he was primarily to blame, Marvin was furious. So Marvin files objections to the rezoning request to allow construction of the plant. His stated reasons were that the concrete plant would block the entrance to his muffler shop, the nuisance of concrete dust, and there were several other reasons. Friends would say that he was also upset because the plant would be located between his home and the shop on a parcel that he used to cut across to get between the two. 
Regardless, his objections and protests and petitions at town meetings actually drug the issue out for several years. But ultimately, in 2001, the city approved construction of the concrete plant. After the decision, Marvin would still continue to file complaints with the city, but of course, they were all denied. Now, it's important to note that the muffler shop was built on a previously undeveloped site, so it did not have access to sewer. And while the city had run its lines in the area, it was up to the property owner to pay to connect to it which in this case came with an estimated cost of $80,000, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense because it shouldn't cost anywhere near that amount. So that price tag may have been a means by which the locals were attempting to force Marvin out of the community. Regardless, Marvin wasn't about to pay that amount, especially while he was in the middle of a dispute with the city. So that issue lingered. So, after the final decision was made to allow the concrete plant and Hemeyer continued to file complaints and objections, the city government really grew tired of his antics and they began to fine him for municipal and health code violations, including not being hooked up to the city sewer system and for storing junk or non-operable vehicles on his property. So as you might imagine, these fines would further enrage Hemeyer. It was some time during this period that Marvin purchased a bulldozer with the stated intention to create a new entrance to his muffler shop, but with the ultimate purpose to create the perfect weapon of mass destruction. You people didn't have to teach me anything. All the crap that you did to me has been done to me before on a much smaller scale. I know... I shouldn't have given you the benefit of the doubt. I should have learned that people are ultimately corrupt. I didn't, I guess. The bulldozer was a modified Komatsu D355 that he referred to as his MK tank in his audio recordings. The D355 was about 13 feet tall, 28 feet long with the blade and over 11 feet wide. The engine was over 400 horsepower, but with only a top speed of 8 miles per hour, so it had some serious low-end power. In total, the behemoth weighed in at just under 100,000 pounds. At some point in time in late 2002, Hemeyer made a decision and began an 18-month project to transform this dozer into what the world would later know as the kill dozer. People ask me, what am I doing? Oh, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> I spent the whole summer of 2003 in that friggin' building, uh, lived there without a shower for as much as four, and four days at a time, working on that dozer, getting it prepared to do what I have to do. So the first thing he did was outfit the bulldozer with armored plates covering the cabin, the engine, and parts of the dozer tracks. And remember, he was a welder by trade, so he was well suited for this type of work. From there, he would pour concrete in between the steel plates, making it totally resistant to small arms and explosives, as the police would soon learn. Since armor covered much of the cabin, video cameras were mounted on the exterior that were protected by 3-inch bulletproof plastic. He also had installed air nozzles that were fitted to blow debris and dust away from these cameras. Inside, there were two TV monitors so that Marvin could see to navigate the killdozer. He also had an air conditioner, fans, food and water, an air tank, and several firearms, including a 50 caliber rifle, a 308 semi-automatic, a 22 long rifle, and a 357 handgun. And the shell was designed with three gun ports so that he could open them and fire his weapons as needed. Interestingly, the armor hull, which was essentially a lid that fit down over the cockpit, was designed with no way of exiting the dozer. And it was 30 tons. 
so heavy with concrete and steel that it had to be lowered by a homemade crane that investigators would find at the shop. But once in place, there was no way for Marvin to get out. And it was clear from his recordings that he never had any intention of exiting. As I mentioned, and you have heard, while Marvin was constructing the Killdozer over 18 months, he made several cassette tapes, which contained about two and a half hours of him talking and explaining why he was doing what he was about to do. He would mail those tapes to his brother the day before the rampage. And while you'll hear clips throughout this video, the entirety of all of those tapes is available on the internet and YouTube if you are interested. And his reasons for the rampage were obvious. He was disgruntled with the city government over the handling of the concrete plant and his property. They took away my life. They took away my future. They took away my hope. They took away any desires that I had. I cannot operate in a community of people that that does that to their neighbors. I wasted 13 years of my life down there because the Thompsons were pissed off that I bought that property. You put yourself in my shoes and tell me how you would feel at 50 years old realizing that you've wasted 10 years of your life because of someone's malice, because of their jealousy, because of their greed, because of their hate. During the construction of the tank on these audio tapes, Marvin specifically stated that he was keeping an open mind and that if something were to occur to dissuade him from his path of destruction, that he would be open to it. But... Ultimately, as it turned out, that never happened. What that one guy say? Those who made me your enemies, or enemy, those who made me your enemy, they are the guilty ones. The Thompsons are guilty. The Dochefs are guilty. The Granby Town Board is guilty. The Granby Planning Commission is guilty. My neighbors are guilty. It took all of you 10 years to get me. And you got me, no doubt about it. I got screwed big time. We talked today about it to Dave Patner. He knows I got fucked. And he knows that they do it. And they get away with it. There's nothing you can do about it, he says. Well, I'm going to do something about it. It may only change people for a generation. Maybe two. May not change them at all. Maybe make them worse. That's the way it's supposed to be. And that's the way it will be. God's will be done. Through me. So on June 4th of 2004, construction was completed. The lid was lowered down upon the killdozer and the rampage commenced. First, Marvin crashed out of his own shop and headed straight for the concrete plant. After Marvin drove through the concrete plant, owner Cody DeChef hopped on a wheel tractor scraper, which is a piece of large excavation equipment, and he met the dozer head on. Hemeyer would fire shots at him before the killdozer brushed the scraper aside and he headed to town at 8 miles per hour. He would proceed to demolish the town hall, the newspaper office, and several homes, including that of a former judge. Authorities would later discover that the attacks were not random. Hemeyer had a handwritten list of targets with him inside the cockpit, with each building that was demolished having some connection to Marvin and his struggles with the town. Police efforts to stop the dozer were essentially useless. They fired over 200 rounds and detonated three external explosives, which had little to no effect. One officer dropped a flashbang grenade down the bulldozer's exhaust, it had no effect either. Next, they tried to disable the cameras. 
but that also failed because they were protected by the bulletproof glass. At one point, a police officer named Glenn Trainer even got atop the killdozer looking for a way in. But not finding any, he was forced to jump off to avoid being hit by debris. So for two hours and seven minutes, the rampage would continue through town, damaging 13 buildings and knocking out utility services to City Hall. The city's reverse 911 system was activated to call residents to alert them of the danger. Hemeyer would fire 15 rounds from two rifles during the rampage. He shot at power transformers, propane tanks, police officers, and of course, Cody DeShep. And the governor was in the process of activating the National Guard to stop the killdozer with Apache helicopters armed with anti-tank missiles. However, as the rampage closed in on its second hour, it became clear that the radiator was leaking fluid and that the engine was smoking and soon to fail. So as Hemeyer smashed into Gamble's hardware store, the weight of the great beast crashed through the first floor and a track became stuck in the basement. And although the dozer labored to free itself, ultimately the engine failed and fell silent. As a SWAT team descended upon the floundering dozer, they heard a single shot that would later be determined was Hemeyer taking his own life by way of his 357 handgun. Thus, the rampage was over and Marvin Hemeyer was dead. You were cowards in the way that you dealt with me the, the, the 10 years that I was in Granby. You people were cowards that you could come to me and say, Marv, we want you out of this town. We hate you. We hate the FDIC. We hate what you, how you benefited from the FDIC's actions and our misfortune and our stupidity. But none of you had the guts to do that. You had to, you had to take me on en masse. Well, I'm going to take you on by myself. It's the only way I know how to do it. I'll be dead when it's over, but that's my conviction. It took several hours, but they finally gained access to the cabin with a cutting torch. Inside, investigators found Hemeyer's written list of targets, and according to police, it included all of the buildings he destroyed, the local Catholic church, which he did not damage, and the names of various people who had sided against him in past disputes. In the end, there was over $7 million in property damage, but no one other than Hemeyer was killed in the spree of destruction. Investigators would interview several individuals who had been at the muffler shop in the weeks leading up to the events, and none of them confessed to knowing that a killdozer was even being constructed. Marvin was described by his friends and family as being likable, and his family said that he would bend over backwards for anyone, although a former customer in town would say that Marvin had threatened him over non-payment of a $124 muffler repair bill. In the end, Marvin Hemeyer died a cult hero to some anti-government, anti-establishment groups. Some claim that Hemeyer went out of his way not to harm any people and only damaged property. However, law enforcement believed this to be more of luck than intent, as during the rampage, Marvin did shoot at several officers and Cody DeChef, the owner of the concrete plant. So, is he an anti-establishment hero or simply another common criminal who snapped? Well, that is for you to decide. So that is the episode. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, hit that like button for me. If you got a question, you got a comment, put it in the comment sections below. If you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button. That is all for today. My name is Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you've been watching Lawyer Up. Send lawyers, guns, and money 